temperamental. Ah, there we go. Randy and I have been looking at the spinning wheel of death that we hope does not end up being a spinning wheel of death for the rest of the show. I will tell you that. It is the Coffin Corner Podcast. The good doctor, Dr. Randy Gisarelli, Sorrent Petro with you. And it's time for our prediction show. First, we'll talk about the roster, how it looks finally. But then time to talk about who the player of the year, pitcher of the year, breakout player, biggest disappointment, best reliever, biggest impact rookie, top prospect. And, of course, everybody's waiting for our prediction on the Royals record. It's all coming your way right now on the Coffin Corner Podcast. You're listening to Kaufman Corner, the most in-depth analysis of the Kansas City Royals, breaking down the Royals like no one else can. Kaufman Corner is hosted by Randy Gisarli and Soren Petro. Randy is a co-founder of Baseball Prospectus, author of Randy on the Royals, and former columnist for Grantland, The Ringer, and The Athletic. Soren is the award-winning afternoon drive host of the program on Sports Radio 810 WHB in Kansas City. Kaufman Corner is proudly brought to you by GAN Asphalt and Concrete, Kansas City's nationally recognized full-service paving and pavement maintenance contractor, making parking lot problems disappear since 1994. Free consultations, no commissions, in-house crews, and every project comes with a written warranty. Find them online at ganasphalt.com or call 816-484-3338. GAN Asphalt and Concrete, one contractor, all things parking lot. Now, here's your hosts, Randy Gisarli and Soren Petro. Thank you, Curtis. We appreciate it. Remember, if you're catching us via the podcast, you can be a part of the conversation in the chat room with our live stream that we always, without fail, do on Sundays at 10 p.m., except for this week. We didn't we didn't do it at 10 p.m. Uh, this week. We're doing it Monday. We are doing it at 10. We're just not doing it on Sunday. We're doing it Monday at 10 p.m. because of some family uh events that uh, came up but better late than never here on the Kaufman Corner podcast and Randy are you excited we're going to talk about the uh the, the the roster what it looks like going into the year but are you excited to make some predictions I, I am Seren I'm I'm excited about the Royal season uh I don't know if you saw the news today the Royals made a uh, a long uh a long overdue uh, decision um, may, might cost them a, a little bit uh, financially, but was absolutely the right move for the organization uh, and will dramatically in- upgrade the uh, experience at Kauffman Stadium. Um, I'm referring, of course, to their decision to switch from Pepsi to Coke products at the stadium. Um, and you think I'm joking, but as a uh, as someone who is Team Coke all the way, I'm, I'm the guy who, when the waiter says, is Pepsi okay? I say no, and I oh. order water instead. I'm, I'm, and then I'm, I'm the guy who then just says, "Please cancel oh. my order. I'm going to go eat somewhere else." And then I'm the guy who sets the fire to the restaurant on the way out the door. So, um, it's a small thing, but it to me is kind of emblematic of the Royals making a lot of small decisions with their roster that probably don't move the needle a lot, but make me feel a little bit better about the direction of the organization. And that's something we'll get into when we talk about the breakdown of the roster. I can't believe you. <laughs> I'm a writer, uh, Saren. What do you expect me to do? Of course, I'm gonna I'm gonna link all these disparate threads together into a cohesive uh, narrative here. Yeah. So, okay. So, so Coke is the Alec Marsh of cola products. I guess I guess in this analogy, and Pepsi is definitely Jordan Lyles. Okay. Okay. There it is. Uh, not enough that Jordan Lyles is out of the rotation. Got to kick a man while he's down. <laughs> kick him by, 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 by referring him to him as Pepsi. That's right. That's the ultimate insult. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. There we go. Um, all right. What do you think about the roster? I mean, this is as close to the ideal 26 man roster that I probably would have put together before the season. Um, you know, before spring training opened, as as the Royals have come in a very long time. Um, you know, it the, the one flying new ointment here, of course, is Michael Massey's, you know, not on the uh, active roster right now. We're hoping it's a very short uh, aisle stint. Um, you know, my concern is he's really, to me, one of the pivotal guys on this team in terms of a breakout season for him would really you know, improve the team's odds of being relevant this season. And he's a guy who's, I mean, his career could go either way. He could be an above average everyday player. He could be, you know, he could lose his job by June. Um, So, you know, having him be healthy is really important. So I'm hoping he'll be back soon. 
they have obviously have Nick Lofton as you know depth, and he's on the roster, and that's great. Um, but other than that, I mean, the choices they made. Obviously, we, we mentioned the fifth starter role, the final spots in the bullpen. Um, you know, the bench is pretty much what we expected. They didn't get uh, seduced by Nick Prado's. Uh, terrific spring and are sending him to Omaha to prove that it's real. They didn't put too much weight on Nelson Velasquez having a disappointing spring and take away his job. Um, the sort of things the Royals would used to do in the past, make decisions based on four weeks of spring training at bats instead of four years of a guy's career. They didn't do that this year. Uh, and I, for one, am grateful for it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I think it was, was it pretty clear there wasn't, the only fight was maybe for that fifth starter spot. I think the the bullpen, um, you know, the last spot or two. I mean, it wasn't a foregone. Maybe there was a fight. Yeah, that's a good point. Matt maybe Sauer. It was going to be a fight, but the injuries rendered it. But. Yeah, the, to some degree. And but also, like, you know, Matt Sauer, if he hadn't pitched well, he might not have won the job. Like, we were taking for for granted that, oh, he's a Rule 5 pick. He has to make the roster. But, I mean, something like half of Rule 5 picks are returned to their original team in spring training. Um, so the fact that he pitched his way onto the team, yes, he obviously has a leg up because he has to if he's going to stay on the roster. But if he had been terrible, they would have sent him back. So he took one of those roster spots. Um, and as the final lefty, you know, Angel Serpa is a guy, you know, I was trying to think of a, of a parallel in Royals history. I had to go back to like someone like Hippolyto Pichardo, a guy who could start, who can relieve, who's just sort of there to give you innings in whatever role you need him to. And is okay. He's mediocre, but like not bad. And there's value in that. Um, I think Serpa could be a guy like that. He's still quite young. Um, and I think that he hasn't been able to stay fully healthy at times. And I think that has kept him off the radar screen. But as a final guy in the bullpen, he's the perfect guy to pick. And then obviously Lyles is the final right-hander in the bullpen because they gave the job to Alec Marsh. So all of those decisions I'm on board with. Um, all right, Nick Prado, you Again, have any thoughts any reaction to that i mean i'm 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 hopeful and optimistic that he you know is going to make more contact uh this season uh, enough contact that maybe he still has a viable major league career but based on what we've seen for the last several years like I i'm not giving him that opportunity based on what he did in spring training no matter how impressive it was uh, i'm trying to find his uh his numbers here this spring training yeah he had 421 he had but more importantly eight strikeouts and 42 plate appearances that's about a 19 percent strikeout rate if he keeps up a 19 percent strikeout rate then he's going i think he's going to be in you know an everyday first baseman of the major leagues in short order i mean that would that's like half of his strikeout rate from years past but it was 42 plate appearances so i am fully on board let him prove it in omaha because if he goes down to Omaha, even in Omaha, he has had strikeout issues in the past. Um, so, you know, give him a month or so to prove that his strikeout rate is in the 25% range. I mean, last year down there was at 30. Well, yeah, last year was about 28%. The year before that, it was around 30%. He needs to get that under 25% in AAA if he's, you know, in order to prove he deserves another job at the majors. So I'm, it's great that he's there if Pasquantino's shoulder acts up or someone in the, you know, MJ Melendez doesn't hit or Velasquez craters, they have an option in AAA. Just like Nick Lofton is that AAA option for the for the infield, and he's going to be on the roster for a week or two. There's nothing wrong with having one or two guys in AAA that are major league caliber and just there isn't a spot for them. Uh, yeah, I listen, I the roster seemed pretty open and shut as we came down the stretch, and the injuries cleared up anything, and they made it pretty clear, clear Jordan Lyles was out you know, with a couple of weeks to go. So uh, out of the rotation. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't know how you could knock too much of what they did. You know, it was a good off season. They went with the right guys. Uh, you know, we've said along and I agree spring training stats don't matter when it comes to projecting what things are going to do, but if you're going to have a battle, you're going to battle for a spot, then what else are you going to look at? And that was clear. You know, Alec Marsh was the better guy. So right, and well, and but again, they they went with the better guy and not the guy who has the contract, not the guy who has, has the innings or has done it before. They Quattro had the quote where like, everybody has to earn their jobs. That seems basic and fundamental. That hasn't always been the case here. So well, I'm not buying that. Not for one second am I buying that. When I see some of the spring training ERAs, um, not everybody earned it. Well, you don't earn it in spring training if you've already earned it at the major league level. Well, like, okay. I don't care what Seth Lugo's here. Like, you know, if you're somebody who's already on the bubble, 
the fact that you're a veteran. Okay, he's. I mean, he's still on the team. The other thing is, I like Jordan Lyles in the bullpen. Like, I actually think he could be valuable in the bullpen because he can give you innings. Um, and you know, if he's not stretched out, maybe he'll actually be somewhat more effective. So I actually think it's good for the team, but it also sends a good message to everybody that look, even Jordan, even though you know, maybe cer- certainly the longest tenured guy in the major leagues on, on the pitching staff, his job is not assured. Like you have to go out there and earn it. Daniel Lynch is going to AAA, and you know that's that's great. He didn't earn a job. Like he was, he didn't even earn a spot on the roster. And in the past, they would hand him a job. He pitched well enough that he's on the radar. He's also depth. If somebody gets hurt, Daniel Lynch is probably getting called up, but he didn't make the team. These are good signs to send to the organization, to the players, to the minor leaguers that were in the business of trying to win this year and not, you know, this is not an evaluation year. Uh, we uh, are proudly brought to you by our friends at GAN Asphalt and Concrete. With free consultations, no commissions, and in-house crews, plus every single project comes with a written warranty, celebrating 30 years as Kansas City's leader when it comes to solving parking lot problems. They've been doing it since 1994. Uh, keeping your parking lot safer, helping you and your business. Avoid unnecessary delays, costly expense, and liability issues. GAN Asphalt and Concrete, Kansas City's best. One contractor, all things parking lot. Find them online at ganasphalt.com. Uh, Randy, let's get to it. Prediction time. All right. You ready? I am. By the way, we'll save our record for the end. Yes. Okay, that's going to happen. Let's start with our player of the year. Clearly, we're going to build in the suspense. <laughs> I, I don't think you have to pick Bobby Wood Jr. here. I think you certainly could say, well, boy, Vinny pascatino has got power and he's got on base. And yes, we all expect a monster monster season from Hunter Renfro. But <laughs> what? You're laughing. Why are you laughing? I am laughing. Yeah, no. we might get to him no. later. I'm, I'll. I'll, I'll <laughs> I think we will. Um, I, actually, I disagree with you. You do have to go with Bobby Wood Jr. Okay. If you're well, I close. did. Because I did. yes, I mean, you know, he's coming off a you know a four point four win season according to Baseball Reference, which is literally double what any other position player on the roster did last year. He is 23 years old. He'll turn 24 in June. Um, There's, you know, all all signs are pointing up and where he was last year was already pretty damn good. So um, if, if he is not the best player on the team, best position player on the team this year, either something went really well or something went really wrong. Yeah, no, I agree. And it would almost take an injury. I think based upon he should be right. in exactly. his prime. Uh, I don't see some kind of sophomore slump because you know what? It's not a sophomore year. Uh, so I don't, I've never heard of a junior slump. So I, I think he's ready to go. And I think he'll be the guy pitcher of the year. I think you, I, I think there is an obvious choice, right? But I think it's easier to pick somebody else besides Cole Reagan's here just because of the injury history. Sure, sure. Um, I think just based on, on a per inning basis, it's Cole Reagan's. And if there was somebody else on the, let's put it this way, if there was somebody else in the rotation who was a, a, a lock for 175 innings, maybe you pick that. But since Jordan Lyles is in the bullpen now, <laughs> there isn't that guy. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm going with Cole Reagan's. Again, if he isn't, something's gone really well or something's gone really badly because it either means he's gotten hurt or it means, I don't know, Brady Singer took some enormous step forward. Um, you know, Cole Reagans is, you know, I think is probably going to be a Cy Young contender. I mean, maybe not win, but like he'll, he'll, if he's healthy, he's going to get votes. There's no one else on the on the pitching staff I would, you know, expect to say that for. Um, so, you know, I, we, we, we created a category when we did this, you know, best player other than Witt, best pitcher, other than Reagan's, because I feel like those were pretty obvious choices. So where do you want to go? Do you want to go next to breakout player, a biggest disappointment, or do you want to go to best position player? No, let's do best position player other than Witt. Let's okay. let's get those out on the table, and then we can talk about breakouts and things okay. like that. All right. Uh, you you uh, you want what do you want? You want player or uh, we'll do uh, player? Um, here, take I'll, 10, I'll, I'll take pitcher. Okay, I'll I'll start with player. Um, so. This was a tough decision for me, and I'm, you know, you mentioned Vinny Pasquantino is sort of, you know, the, um, the guy who could be the best player on the team, and he could be, and he would be my second choice for this. But I actually am going to plant my flag on Michael Garcia, um, and the reason is, for Pasquantino to be the second best Royals player, he has 
to match. He has one route to do it, one pathway. He has to hit and hit a ton and stay pretty healthy. Like there's a scenario where Pesquantino is a really good player, but he plays 110 games or whatever. And, you know, he might be worth, and at his position, even if he hits, I don't know, even if he has like an 850 OPS, he might only be worth two and a half, three wins. Michael Garcia could be the best, second best player on the Royals if he hits for, for more power. That's really the one thing. If he just gets to double digits and home runs and doesn't do anything other than what he did last year, he could be that guy. He also could be that guy by just being an otherworldly defensive third baseman, which I think he is capable of. He is a guy who is capable of playing shortstop in the major leagues who has been moved to third base. I I, I love that uh, profile. I've talked a lot about it going back to when I advocated for Bobby Whitby moved to third base because I love having two shortstops on the left side of my infield. The Royals have that. And I think Michael Garcia could be a plus 10 defender very easily at third base by some metrics he was last year. Um, you know, the, the best defensive third baseman in baseball, maybe arguably the best defensive player at any position in the majors right now is Cabrian Hayes of the Pirates, who's a plus 20 defender over there. He's consistently a four win player, even though Cabrian is not a great hitter. He's maybe league average. His own career OPS plus is exactly 100, but an average hitter who's at, you know, the best defensive third baseman in the game is an all-star. And I think Michael Garcia won't be that good defensively, but I think he could be almost that good defensively. So if he's even average at the plate, I think he could be a three and a half, four win player. And that puts him a little bit ahead of Pasquantino. Well, I thought we'd end up with the same guy and we did. Uh, I have Michael Garcia as well for all the reasons that you stated. I think there is a pedigree of him being a better hitter in the minor league. So I expect him to grow into the role. And I did not like hearing, you know, when I asked, um, the hitting coach, um, Zumwalt, Alex Zumwalt. Uh, Alex Zumwalt. Does he need to get more loft? I didn't like hearing when he said, no, we don't want him to change a yeah. thing. I, I, I still don't like that, but I think it was more of a statement. Like if Michael Garcia hears this, I'm saying what I want Michael Garcia to hear. Right. And that is, we love you. You're the guy. I think they feel like he just needs to know the pitchers better. And he's had more loft in the past. So with better knowledge will come better production. And so they, that statement seemed to say, we believe in Michael Garcia. So I'm going to say that they're right. And he starts looking The on base comes up. We get some more pop, some more doubles and Michael Garcia takes a step. So I'm with you. And for all the same reasons, I worry about Vinny Pascatino's health and I don't think he's going to be a great first baseman. So I go Garcia as well. Pitching. Right. Well, I just want to say, I completely agree with what you said about Zumwalt's statement. Like, it's the one thing I'm nervous about. Like, the, the Royals are, it, it, it's it's like turning a battleship, right? Turning an organization around. Like, it is a very slow process. I like the, where they're moving in almost every direction. But the one thing that is that I, I've not seen any evidence is that they are really on board with what, what they're doing on the pitching side with, you know, using, you know, high-speed video and data to improve a pitcher's approach i don't get as much of a sense of that on the hitting side that you just like you you know there are ways to teach pitchers velocity teach pitchers spin teach pitchers new pitches there is a way to teach hitters to hit the ball in the air on the pull side and maybe not every single hitter you want to do that with but most hitters Yes, even a Michael Garcia, you think of, you know, you might think of as, oh, just a, a slap hitter. No, he hits the ball hard. So when you got a guy who hits the ball hard, lift it and pull it. And I don't, I don't get the sense that the Royals are fully on board with that. And that's the one area where they are still behind the curve when it comes to the industry standards. So I'm like you. I'm hoping that one statement that he made speaks volumes. We, we've talked about it before. I'm hoping it is them being coy or them, like you said, issuing a vote of confidence to him and not that they're actually okay with him continuing to hit balls 110 miles into the ground. Cause that's what Eric Cosmer did. And that's where, why Eric Cosmer is, you know, re retired and Freddie Freeman who it's came up with him is, is yeah, the podcaster, <laughs> the, the worst fate imaginable. He's a podcaster now. Um, and Freddie Freeman who came up with him uh, is, you know, still, you know, an MVP candidate. So, um, We'll, we'll, we'll see. I'm the, one of the most important stats I'm looking at in April is launch angle, average launch angle for Michael Garcia. We'll, we'll know fairly soon if he's hitting the ball in the air more. Best pitcher not named Cole Reagans. 
I think this is a little bit harder. I tried to find some crafty things. I want Seth Lugo. Um, <laughs> you know, which you did too, right? Yeah, I did. <laughs> we end up, like, we always think we're going to be, oh, I, I'm so crafty. And then the other one's thinking the exact same thing. So, look, I, I, he's got good stuff. He took to, you know, pitching out of the rotation uh, in San Diego. He's still in a pitcher's park. I don't see any reason for him to back up the bus. Spring numbers aren't there, but I think he is a guy that I think was working on things. Um, got enough of a track record as a pitcher, maybe not as a starter. So my assumption is he's working on things. I don't worry about the spring numbers. They believe in him. I'm going to trust, you know, they've been doing some better things with the pitching. I'm going to trust that they have a good eye for it. So I'll take Seth Lugo. Yeah, no, I, for all, all the same reasons. that, that was, I, I was tempted to take Brady Singer. And, you know, Brady Singer has that upside that he showed. I was, much. and then I came to my senses. <laughs> well, and I guess ultimately I did too. Like, there is an upside for Singer that may be a little higher than the upside for Lugo, but the floor for Lugo is so much higher. Um, the, the, the concern you would have is simply health. Um, he's, uh, you know, he's never really been ineffective in the major leagues. And in eight years, you know, his highest FIP, he's never had a FIP of above four and a half. He's had an ERA higher because ERA has a lot of luck, but the fundamental skills are demonstrated with his FIP. He's never been above four and a half. Um, and, you know, last year more than doubled his inning total from the year before because he moved from the bullpen to the rotation. No degradation in his in his uh, results and his stuff. I mean, 140 strikeouts to 36 walks. That's exceptional. All out of the rotation after he hadn't, you know, he hadn't been a full time starter in the majors since 2017. And his arm is fresh. Yes, he's 34 years old, but there's probably reason to think that he isn't. He, he hasn't expended quite as many bullets out of that arm because he's been working in relief. Um, I know the you know the Royals were in, were reportedly very interested in trying to sign him last year. They got outbid. They decided not to let that happen again. But last year, the gamble was nobody knew for sure could he move into the rotation. He's now proven it. That's why he got more money, obviously. But I think if he just repeats what he did last year, he'll be very good. And, you know, there's a chance he made 26 starts last year. If he can stay healthy for 30 or 31, maybe you can get a few more innings out of him. But even what he did last year, I, I would probably make him the second best starter on this team. Um, By the way, I need to point out our friend Blake. Uh, hear me out. Disappointment. Jordan Lyles. Smart ass. Uh, you can always count on Blake for a smart comment there. Uh, that does bring us to breakout and disappointment. I will give you disappointment, and I will take breakout for the leadoff. Okay. All right. And and I want to say, Blake, the idea. I don't know how Jordan Lyles could disappoint after last year. What would he have to do? Run out with a bat and whack Cole Reagans on the knee? Like, what would it take for Jordan Lyles to disappoint? <laughs> just I, Danny, flat I, out moon the audience. Just go out there and just yeah. pull his pants down, drop trowel on the mound. I, 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 I wanted to bring that up from Blake because I think you might actually still take him as your disappointment. Well, I won't. So. Okay. <laughs> But you're so you're going to start with the breakout player. Let's. I, I have a feeling we're going to be in in uh, in cahoots or, on the next. Or you couple. can hit di disappointment first. Okay, you, want. you want to start with this one? Okay. My yeah. disappointment, which I assume you're going to be in the same place, is Hunter Renfro. Yes. Yeah. I just I said it. You know, you know, since he was signed, he's the one guy, the one free agent the world has signed in in a role where I just feel like they're expecting more from him than he's capable of. He's not a he's not a youngster anymore, and with hitters. The aging curve is much less forgiving than for pitchers. Like Seth Lugo at 34 doesn't concern me. Hunter Renfro at 32 as a corner outfielder, that concerns me. And, you know, his bat is, you know, showed decline last year. You know, his OPS was 713. The year, the two years before that, it was above 800. So it already shown decline. His glove has shown decline. Um, and he's at an age that you expect decline. So uh, I'm concerned. I just worry that he's not going to be not going to contribute offensively or defensively. He's in it. He's going to run into some balls. This is what the Royals do. You know, sometimes off like a right, like a Jose Guillen, you know, he hits 20 bombs. Okay. He hits 20 bombs, but he hits like 230. His OBP is under 300. He plays a position where you expect a lot of offense and he doesn't contribute defensively. I just, there's, there's definite um, collapse risk here that he is going to be, um, he's going to be needed. To, he's going to be needed to be replaced by the end of the season. Like the Royals are going to have to find an alternative to him uh, as an everyday right fielder. 
Well, and I and I'll say this: it's it's a disappointment too that um, yeah, maybe I should have brought this up a little bit more in the in when we were talking about the final roster, but Drew Waters going down. I mean, to me, what you really wanted was for Drew Waters to go win the job, or at least be on the team. Oh, they want him to play every day. Yeah, because he's not good enough to play every day on this team. And Hunter Renfro is the one part that looks like it might be like, well, we signed him, so we're going to give him first try. Right. And if you don't believe in spring numbers, he should get first try. But yeah, I'm 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 a little bit nervous that you know I I mentioned it was one of the things I wanted to see out of spring training him to hit well, not because spring training numbers meant anything, just so we would have a reason to sit here and not pick him for the disappointment, right? Because it was the most questionable of the signing. So yeah, right. I'm in, I'm in agreement. So. Yeah, no, with and then with Waters, I'm wrong. Well, I mean, we'll both be wrong. It wouldn't be the first time, but. But I mean, and if you tell me now he's going to have a good year, like like I said, with like Michael Massey having a breakout year, like that would make me feel much better about this team's chances of really surprising, you know, the the, the entire, uh, you know, all of baseball. Um, regarding Waters, I just want to say, I mean, the, the the problem there is it's a four man bench. If the Royals had gone with fourteen position players instead of thirteen, Drew Waters would be there. If you're going to carry only four guys, Dyron Blanco makes more sense in a bench role. Than Drew Waters, but the concern, like you said, is that Waters is maybe a better starting right fielder than the guy they already have. But once they signed Renfro, that ship has sailed. I hope he goes down there. He hit, he rakes in AAA, and that way, if Renfro stumbles, they're gonna be they're going to have an alternative. Um, they can't just ignore. I hope. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, breakout player. I think we're on the same guy. That's why I wanted to go first on this one. MJ <laughs> Melendez. Yep. We are perfect six for six. I think in agreement now. So no, no longer the whipping boy. We 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 he will be no, if he doesn't break out. Let's put it that I, way. <laughs> listen, I'm not I'm not sold that we're going to see any kind of hitting. I actually think if this happens, and I do think there's a decent chance because again they're staying with him. We're hearing good things, right? And and so I I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I just I I do think the one thing is it's going to come a DH. I mean, I think the Mike Sweeney treatment is what needs to happen. He needs to go. And I think the reason, uh, one of the reasons why I think he can break out is because uh, I think he's going to get some platoon. I think they've got enough right-handed bats to not make him go out there and see tough lefties. And so I think that'll kind of boost the numbers, which hopefully will boost the confidence. Not playing in the outfield that much will hopefully, you know, again, boost the offensive confidence. Um, Or I'm totally wrong. And the fact that it was his first off season to actually focus on being an outfielder, everybody says he's a really good athlete and he comes out there and looks like a solid average outfielder. And he says, shut your mouth, fatty. Uh, I can play outfield. And so I think there's a number of paths that lead to him breaking out. Right. I mean, let's think about it. this time last year, he was still a part-time catcher, right? Like he had the whole winter to focus on playing one position, um, if he can't do it, then yes, to 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 DH with you, MJ. But um, I think he deserves the opportunity to show he can at least be you know, serviceable out there. But the bat, I mean, they've got him today. Was uh, you know the lineup against uh, Northwest Arkansas? They had the the exhibition down there. Um, looked like a preview of what the opening day lineup was going to be, and he was batting fifth, right behind Salvador Perez. Um, and I think that's where they expect him to be. Like he, they expect him to be that kind of fulcrum of the lineup who can draw walks and hit bombs out of the, uh, the, the fifth spot. And if he hits, you know, 280 with, you know, 60 walks and 25 or 30 home runs, even at DH, he's in, that'll be a hell of a player. So this is, this is a, a huge make or break year for him. And if he doesn't break out, then we're both going to turn on him. But I think that he's got one last opportunity to prove that he can be a valuable member of the team. Highlight a couple of comments. Curtis says, MJ, um, no, he'll be a huge liability on defense. I, I do think that's a possibility. Again, I, I stated why I think maybe that won't be the case, but I tend to think that it's going to be as a DH. And so all we're going to be talking about is the bat, and that's why how I get him there. And then Noah John says, uh, these are uh, these are predictions based on hope or analysis. Seren knows MJ Melendez is done for regardless of his last year's end. I, I actually don't. I mean, I'm going. Look, I I I think I'm, you know, I have enough uh, humility, know my place in this world, that I read stats and I read people. I don't read swings. I'm not qualified 
people who are still believe in that swing, uh, still believe in the pop. The exit velocity is there. That's the one. That's a number that I can look at. I, I, I think we will learn a lot with MJ Melendez about how much we can trust what comes out of the mouths of Matt Quattrero and JJ Picola. There's also, I mean, I always like it when like this with the scouting reports and the data line up. And in the first six weeks of last season, Melendez's numbers were were pretty terrible, but his all of his expected metrics were much, much better. Like the, the data suggested he was hitting into bad luck and he was actually like he was striking the ball well and just not getting results. And then for about six weeks, he was just legitimately bad. But then in the second half, both his expected and his actual numbers were much, much better. I mean, I think he had a 120 OPS plus after the All-Star break, something like that. Like he was a good hitter after the All-Star break. Um, so all the to me, the data backs up what what people like Quartero and JJ Piccolo are saying, which is he's a good hitter. You know, he has to he's maybe a little strikeout prone. Um, you know, the defense is very much a, a question mark, but he hits the ball as hard as anybody on the team. Um, and, you know, he has good awareness of the strike zone that give me those two things. And I'll take, I'll take a chance on that hitter and hope that he figures things out. All right. I'll give you the honors on best reliever. So best reliever. Um, uh, by the way, I'm already copying and pasting what I have down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably, we're probably the same here. I mean, I'm going to, I, I kind of chalky, but it's also kind of, uh, uh, kind of risky going with a rookie, but I'm going to go with James MacArthur. <laughs> we're, we're still. I promise. I promise all of you. I think. I think we we're did be not. A... We did not discuss no, any didn't... of these names beforehand. The only one now that I look at because we have impact rookie and top prospect at the end of the year, and the only way we're going to be different, in my opinion, we'll be different on our bold and daring predictions, just because it's so yeah, right. open ended. But the only way we're different is on the record. And I will bet you money. And we've both written down our record. We have. Yeah, we wrote it ahead of time. It's on a sheet of my paper. <laughs> we have it. And we'll flip it around at the same time. But we, I, might, I'll be, we might disagree on prospect. We typically do not always I'll line up on the prospect. So. There's no way. Yeah. No way. Um, so, yeah. So, MacArthur, I mean, you know, what he did in September of last year was really, really impressive. I mean, and. You know, he finished the year two walks and 23 strikeouts. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, his ERA was high because he got, I think he got destroyed in his, his major league debut, if I recall. But like you take out that one outing. Um, yeah, he gave up seven runs in his in his uh, major league debut in June, came back in August and gave up five runs the rest of the way. You know, 205, 201 ERA after his major league debut. Um, and uh, also, I mean, there's a lot of, good or decent relievers on this team, but there's really no other stud. I mean, he's, he might be the hardest thrower in the bullpen to start the year with, with Carlos Hernandez on the disabled, uh, on the injured list. Um, Will Klein and John McMillan are still in AAA. So, you know, if there's one thing the bullpen is missing, they don't have that fire breathing upper nineties guy. Um, he throws, MacArthur throws probably in the mid nineties, but his slider is his, is his out pitch. It's an awesome pitch. Um, he won't necessarily be the closer, but that's to start the season, but that's okay. You know, and frankly, if the world's end of trading Will Smith at the deadline, he may end up being the closer in the second half. Um, I just, I feel really good about, uh, about him as in, in the, you know, short to medium term being a, an impact major league reliever. Yeah, I do too. Um, he's got the best stuff. He's, he's the guy. I mean, I think he almost has to get hurt to not be the answer because I think the rest of the guys are just okay. I mean, Will Smith's not going to, bounce back to the to his peak form. That's just not right. going to happen. So he's the one guy that looked like he was finally you know, ready to go and, and has a lot of ceiling. So, all right, uh, you want me to take impact rookie? Yeah, you go next. I Again, I think you will have the same guy, Matt Sauer. Hmm. No? Well, no, only because I just I just told you who my guy is. James MacArthur is still a rookie. So, so I you him there? Yeah, I decided to go with him as well. So, but Matt Sauer, okay. That well, that's a good point. I guess I, 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 I probably, I do think MacArthur will be better than Sauer. So that's I probably should have the same guy. Um, but make the case for Sauer because I mean, if if Sauer well, is an impact guy, coming yeah, to I, pick, I, I, guess I, I don't know why I didn't keep in mind that Mac MacArthur had rookie status. I guess I was thinking I saw him last year, and I was just putting somebody different in each slot. Look, I think Sauer has stuff. And 
I think we're going to, I think he is a great example. The whole plan with, with what they've done and the Rays bit is they identify value when other people don't see it and they make guys better when they get there, particularly on the pitching side. And so I'm going to hang my hat on the success of some of the guys like MacArthur that came over. And I think he's going to get the extra weapon. The early returns against retraining numbers don't mean anything, but whatever he was doing was effective. And I'm, and, and, and he had strikeout stuff already uh, while pitching in a longer role. Now you put him in the back and you ramp him up and you know what? No, I'm going to defend this. This is what I wanted to do. You know what? It's not, obviously I'm, you're seeing through my, my logic here, but I actually don't mind it because it basically gives me two shots at, at being right. You know, I, I've got each guy, you're all in on one guy. If MacArthur gets hurt, well, you, you're screwed twice. I've still got sour, but I do think, I think he could be MacArthur, you know, 2.0. Yeah, no, I'm, you know, I, I, I like the pick at the time. He's, you know, pitched well in spring training. And the, the, you mentioned the, the strikeout stuff. The, the reason I liked the pick and the reason why I think there's some sneaky upside here, because most rule five guys, you know, you figure they can, I, either they have like big upside, but enormous risk. They may not even make the team or they're like safe picks that, you know, you know, are probably going to break the, uh, uh, a break camp with the team, but there's just not a lot of upside there. The thing that intrigues me about him is, he, he showed really impressive strikeout stuff in the minors each of the last two years, despite pitching as a starter, right? Last year, right. 93 strikeouts in 74 innings. The year before, 134 strikeouts on 109 innings. So strikeout per nine of 11.3 and 11.1. He he made one bullpen appearance in two years. Like all, all of those innings, with like exception of one, was made as a starter. Now he gets to work in short stints out of the bullpen. Yeah, he's moving to the major leagues. He's never pitched above double A, but that the transition from double A to the majors is going to be softened a lot by the transition from rotation to bullpen. And if he shows that kind of strikeout stuff, his command isn't great, but it's not terrible. Um, you know, and I think obviously the Royals see something with him. They they can they've shown an ability to work with guys like MacArthur, being a great example from other organizations, and and get them to you know improve not just their stuff, but also their control, their command a little bit. I mean, Cole Reagan's that, that was the case to some degree. Um, so even if he's a little bit wild to start, this is a guy who not only could have a good rookie year, but actually if he does, he's not going to be just a, a low ceiling, high floor guy. Like he could actually be an important part of this bullpen for several years. He might even have the ability to move into a rotation at some point in the future. So as a player, I mean, I like the pick, and I actually think, yeah, he could have a, an impact on this team for three or four years to come. All right. Um, top prospect, end of the year. So I am I assume we're not going to have the same guy here. and I There's mean, only but, one choice. You, well, you're either going to get this right or you're going to screw it up. Okay. Well, I'm probably – well, in that case, I'm screwing I'm, I'm screwing up your, your best laid plans. I'm going to go a little off the board because there is an obvious choice, but I'm taking the other Blake. Because you know, just all the talk of him in spring training, Blake Walters. Yeah, that's the only choice. The only choice. Blake Mitchell's not the not not a choice. The the first round pick. You're already oh. so so oh. we we landed on the same guy through. Okay, we as always. I, I told you we'd be the same guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know you. Uh, well, like, fine. You knew you knew me. You know you know you know what I think of of both Blakes. I guess. I just this is purely based on talk in spring training, and. The fact that, you know, the Royals, it seems like they draft the one of the frustrating things about the Royals is the last few years, they draft a high school pitcher who's projectable, and then he doesn't project. He doesn't add velocity. We're still waiting on uh Mazzucato. Uh no, no Buccaneer Bruce. Ace Lacey will uh not be the Royals top prospect at the end of the year. That's a couple we, of folks. We, 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 we appreciate Buccaneer the uh, Bruce, the Jason, Ace Lacey? Ace Lacey, well, yeah. Yeah, well, we remember. I think we one of us said we wanted to see Ace Lacey in spring training, and the other one said we want to see Ace Lacey on a mound. And we saw we saw him in spring training, but we didn't see him on a mound, and um, it's unfortunate. At this point, I mean, I, I don't know what you can say except I hope he gets healthy and you know try again next year. But um, but to me, the, what's exciting is that unlike Mazzucato or even like Ben Coderna, like these guys are fine, but they they didn't come back after their first pro season throwing harder than before, showing better stuff the stuff that you want to see from an 18, 19 year old pitcher that they're actually still improving their velocity. We're hearing buzz about that with Blake Walters and he was already a hard thrower. So if he's really, you know, 
sitting in 97, you know, at, at age 19, the, he has the chance to finally be that that Royals minor league pitching prospect who goes out and, you know, has 90 strikeouts by the All-Star break and is making all the midseason top 100 prospect lists. I really hope he's that guy. I, I, I will be – the way they talked, and again, I read people, right? Um, they, there's no shortage of excitement. I mean, they're, they're giddy on this one. Okay. So – yeah, that that's why, and I told you that when when we came back that they they they're all about it, and and, and the early returns are already good. So it'll be very interesting to see if he breaks camp with the A ball team. If he does, that's a really good sign. If they hold him back, I I would be surprised if he's not there. Like I would be su- very surprised if they wait all the way until the uh, complex league start for him to get, uh, you know, official mound time this year um you know they, they might like they did with mazagato Conderna, wait till like early may but i'm really hoping that we'll see in the next 10 days that he's assigned to low a ball um and he comes right out of the shoot in a in a you know professional rotation that'll be a really good sign yeah no i i, I agree wholeheartedly all right now what do you want to do do you want to wait on record till after prediction let's save that to the very very end yeah, very good. By the way, we're brought to you by Gay and Asphalt and Concrete, proudly serving the greater KC metro area, nationally recognized full-service paving and pavement maintenance contractor, making parking lot problems disappear in Kansas City since 1994. One contractor, all things parking lots. Uh, if you need a restriped, a brightly striped lot, uh, cuts down on accidents, keeps your parking lot as safe as possible. Curb bumpers, signage, they do it all. Everything. One contractor. All things parking lot, find them online at ganasphalt.com. That's ganasphalt.com. All right, we'll go back and forth. Uh, right. I can get closer to my computer here to actually physically type real things. <laughs> um, what do you got? You want to go first or second? I'll go first. We'll alternate back and forth. So, and to be clear, we, we're, we're making five bold and daring predictions. I'm at least going in order of least bold to most bold. So, we're going to start with something that it may not sound crazy ridiculous, but is unlikely maybe. And then by the end, it's, I'm going to make some outrageous, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try for the 1% call and we'll see how it goes. Uh, okay. All right. So my first one, my first prediction at the end of the season, the Royals will have four consensus top hundred prospects in, in baseball after having zero to one this year. Um, the four, you know, would be. And that's your, year. that's your least likely. <laughs> that's my least. I mean, or look, most likely, having, that's the least bold. Least that's bold, yeah. bold as I mean, that's zero there. now. Well, so so here's the case for it. They have the sixth pick in the draft. That will probably be one. I mean, Blake Mitchell was the seventh pick in the draft last year, and he's on at least some of the lists. Like, what, they have like 0.5 right now because of Blake Mitchell. So you're going to throw Walters on there as well and say, they well, Mitchell, I think will do, we'll be there. You know, I I don't expect I don't expect a huge breakout, but if he just has a good year, I think he'll be at the bottom of the list. Like, uh, Mitchell, right now, Walters, Walters the will be pick. there. And then, and then somebody the will, break. right. Um, somebody will break up. But it basically, it's a bet on the Blakes. It's a bet on the fact that after you know maligning this final draft and and you know picking Mitchell over just a whole host of college guys, which still may you know, I would still argue is a mistake. But if Mitchell is even okay and Walters is the real deal, then this could actually turn out to be a a, a nice draft for the Royals. Um, and then they have a top six pick and they'll get lucky with somebody. Well, that, that's my the bold the boldness here is basically that somebody else will will step up out of this organization. Um, they have a few a few possibilities there. There's some Latin American guys. Um, so anyway, that's my first one. Four top hundred prospects at the end of the year. Okay, the Royals will finish third in the American League Central. You okay. want at least. Yep. So I've got them finishing third in the American League Central. I think everybody's got them probably fourth, but they will beat one of the other teams. So, so they'll finish above fourth. fourth. Let's say above yeah. fourth, right? Because could fourth. Uh, let's say they're second or first, but okay, above fourth. Okay, above fourth. Yeah. So okay. I'll go. The Royals will finish above fourth. I, I think. I think they're going to be. You know, and this is a little bit of a tell. Uh, I think somebody bombs in the in the the guys up front, and and I think the Royals will be steady, Eddie. That's kind of a peek into where I'm going record wise, but um, you know, I, I think they finish third or better. I I, I think. It's it's a good it's a good prediction to start with. It's absolutely possible. I'll tell you, I'm actually 
like if if there's a team that bombs, I actually don't. I think it won't be the Tigers. Like the Tigers to me are actually as so much as we we kind of are trying to carve a path or, or see a path for the Royals to be contenders. Everything we see about the Royals from that perspective, I feel like applies to the Tigers maybe a little bit more. That rotation is actually really good. They don't have much of an offense, but if they hit even a little bit. Um, but the question is, you know, could the Guardians or the Twins have a really disappointing year? I think it could happen. Um, but it also means if they're third, that means that the Royals have had a, probably a better than expected season. So, by the way, I do. Curtis had the same. Uh, Randy, that's that's the least bold. Can't wait for the other ones. Yeah, I'm right. I'm, I'm with you. All right, what do you got next? Uh, next, Vinny Pasquantino will be the first Royal since 1989 to draw 90 walks in a season. I feel like I have this prediction every damn it. One of these years, somebody's going to draw 90 walks on this team. It's I think especially bold just because Pasquantino, no guarantee he's going to play 150 games. It's 1990 uh, when Seitzer did it. 89, 1989, so- Kevin Seitzer through 102 walks. And since then, the highest is Carlos Santana. Okay. Years ago, got to 86. So at the very least, the most walks by a Royal setter since 1989. You know, Pasquantino, if he's healthy, what we've seen from him as a hitter, he, he knows the strike zone. He has the power to keep pitchers honest. You know, he's going to be batting third, likely behind Salvador Perez. Like he's going to have good hitters, hopefully behind him. So, you know, he doesn't have he doesn't have to feel the need to swing at borderline pitches. Um, I just I just think he's a, an incredibly talented pure hitter who also knows the strike zone. Or else I've had really talented pure hitters over the years, you know, Mike Sweeney we talked about, but who didn't have quite the plate discipline that Pasquini you know, has shown. So it's this is a bold prediction. It, uh, it probably won't happen, but it could. All right. Deciding on which ones I want to put in here. Okay, I know how I want to do it. Um, Chris Bubich takes Brady Singer's spot in the rotation when he returns. Ooh. Now, when he that- returns, when he returns to the big leagues, and I will say that I don't get this right if he just comes back and pitches in the minor leagues. I'm saying he's going to come back. He's going to maybe start the minors. I'm sure, probably to get things going. He's going to pitch well. He's going to come to the big leagues. And he's going to knock. So it's kind of a dual prediction. Right. Bubich comes back and is the real deal. Singer is headed to the bullpen. I was going to say, I mean, the you know, or even or even traded. Well, I was going to say this is like the opposite of the uh, you had. They they had me in the first half. I'm not going to lie, mean because you had me all positive there the first, and then you got to Singer. It's like, wait a minute. It's good for Bubich, but it also means you don't trust in Singer. Like the fact that you're picking Singer, not someone like Marsh, who hasn't done you know, who hasn't had a even any success in the majors. Or well, Marsh, Marsh will probably have hit the DL <laughs> injury, okay, well. and Jordan Lyles will be nailing down innings in bushels. Back, 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 back to being back to being the uh, the 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 underrated ace of the of the team. I get it. Um, yeah. I mean, Bubich. I you know, it's easy to forget about him. You know, because of the surgery, obviously, but you know, he's, there's a good chance he's going to be ready to go in the major leagues by July, half of, you know, half the season. And Chris Bubich is a really interesting wild card for this year. I absolutely grant you that. And exciting. If he replaces Singer, then again, something's kind of gone wrong there. Um, But that's why we call it a bold prediction. So, I mean, I mean, what are you, are you all, Duckies and bunnies on your predictions here? Or? Yeah, no, no, it doesn't. Hey, it's bold. It's bold. I'm just like I'm okay, trying to make. No, I'm trying to make mine all, all positive. <laughs> are yours all positive? Yeah, I'm trying to. Oh my god! All right, what do you got next? Uh, I, I can't. I can't. You. I, I can't help being who I am. All right. The, you can't make the scorpion not sting. Sting. You can't mm-hmm. make me not be optimistic. Um. All right. You know. Speaking of optimism, number number three, the Royals will be buyers at the deadline. Ooh. Okay. Right? If they're if they're at 500 or two games below 500, if they're five games out of a playoff spot, it's going to be a tough tough spot for JJ for sure. Um, you know, and especially you know they could move some guys, but here's the thing: like you think about the veterans that they might trade away, and a lot of them it, their value is complicated by the fact that they have op- like a, a player option for next year. Like my, uh, Michael Walker, if a team trades for him, they're getting him for two months, but they're also maybe getting him for an extra year if he pitches poorly. Like a lot of teams don't want to trade for a guy where the upside is two months and the downside is a year and a half. So maybe difficult to trade 
you know, to be a seller at the deadline. They could do it with their bullpen guys. But if they're in anywhere close to the race, you know, the, the Royals are hoping that they're going to have, you know, a, a, a new stadium that's come around the horizon and they want, want to build momentum and build some vibes around this team before the Chiefs steal all, away all of the spotlight when, you know, training camp opens. Um, I could see them, you know, not not mortgaging the future, but patching a couple of holes. Maybe they need a right fielder, um, you know, maybe just adding a bumping piece or, or a fifth starter. Um, and just hoping that this weak division stays so weak down the stretch that they can sneak sneak in with 81 or 83 wins or whatever and steal away the division, or at least you know bring a bunch of crowds to Kaufman in September and and you know come out and root for a, a puncher's chance to make the playoffs. Number three for me, can't help you with your buyer at the deadline. The Royals trade Salvador Perez at the deadline. Yeah, I mean that that's a possibility. I feel like. That they well, almost did it last year. Everything's right. a possibility. <laughs> um, I, 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 and and maybe I'll add more to this when I get to the record. I don't want to give too much away on that. But yeah, they're they're Salvador is moving. Salvador is moving. I'll give more about that on the record. Just okay. remind me about Salvador on the record because I don't want to tip my hand on what the record is because you think we're going to be different. I think we're going to be within two games of each other. On the record, I'm I'm worried we're going to be like last year, be identical again. I mean, if we're not identical on everything else, why wouldn't we? I think we'll be pretty close, yeah, uh, for sure. So yeah, but Salvador Perez traded at the deadline. He he gets traded to a contender, and uh, and you know Freddie Fermin is playing well, which helps make it happen. Of course, Blake Mitchell's a top 100 prospect, as you pointed out. So they're just loaded at catching. They finally make the right move. If 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 they're not like in contention, then that sounds like probably the right move. They came very close to making that move last year at the deadline, so it will be interesting. the The biggest question will be: Is Salvador Perez going to have a good enough year the first four months of the season to justify? It? You know, like, well, I, I picked Hunter Renfro as my disappointment because that was pretty clear. But if he hadn't been on the team, you know, it, it so, would have been yeah. tough not to pick Salvi just just because of his age and you know, wear and tear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean. I love Salvador and. Man, I hope he can, does this forever, but, um, you know, the end comes for us all. So. <laughs> if Salvi's moving, at least I could see him play. He's talking about the Royals TV deal. I love it. That's fantastic. I still don't even know what the hell, what the hell they're on. Opening I, mean, I think, being a, being an out of tenor, I think I could just use my MLB.com app. Like, I'm actually, this is this is the horrible irony of, you know, baseball's ridiculous blackout rules etc is that me living in chicago almost makes it easier or certainly less stressful for me to watch royals games i can just open the app and it's always there you're you're going to be dealing with 37 different channels and two different streamers and god only knows you know and then the random apple tv friday night game you know it's i actually think i'll be okay because i have direct tv i have direct tv and youtube tv so i think and i have apple and i have (laughs) You know, that's the only way to make it work. Unfortunately, you know, we got rid of cable and we just replaced it with well everything else that costs more. Apple was a sweet treat for the Sporting Kansas City match on Saturday. Let me tell you that. I was sad in the end that I actually got it going, but um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right, number four. Number four, Bobby Wood Jr. has the best American League MVP voting finish since George Brett in 1985. As you will probably recall, was second. he was, I believe, second. Second to Don Mattingly, right? I believe so. Um, yeah, I could. I probably should confirm that. The the high. I mean, it would it would actually not be a very bold prediction if it were not for Lorenzo Cain in 2015, because Cain finished third that year. Um, in '85, yes, Brett was second. Um, aside from Cain, the I don't think the Royals have had a top six finisher. Um, since 1985. The, the next high is to Salvador Perez, actually, in 2021. He finished seventh. But I'm going to predict that Bobby Witt will finish in the, I'm basically saying in the top two, right? Like he might, he, that's, that's, we're getting bold here. I don't think anybody would be shocked if he did. There's a lot of competition in the American League, obviously, you, you know, among young players. I mean, Julio Rodriguez and the, the Orioles have like five different guys who could do it. Um, but if the Royals are, surprisingly good this year if they're around 500 they'll get that'll get some you know helium for him and really if he just you know 
cuts down on on his chase rate by five percent. If he just swings at a few fewer pitches outside the strike zone, gets his walk rate up, um, you know, he'll have more opportunities to steal. He'll get better pitches and hit for more power. Um, but the, really, the power and speed. If he just duplicates what he did last year, but hits closer to three hundred, you know, maybe two ninety with a three fifty or three sixty OVP, and pl- playing shortstop, he's going to get some MVP, you know, MVP consideration even more than he did last year. So. That's that's my prediction there. Bold and daring, Kyle Isbell grabs firmly a hold of the center field job and posts a three thirty on base. Well, now that's just crazy talk, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I I think, uh, and and it's probably my boldest is that Salvi will be traded. Probably should have been last if I were doing it the order you were. But I was afraid you might say something like that, so. Uh, and I wanted to do it opposite your trade prediction. <laughs> but um, I, I do think there's a chance Kyle Isbell makes it work. And I'm I'm rooting for him. I'm rooting for him because I want the defense. Right, and exactly. Defense. And so this is more of a wish than I actually think it's going to come true. But, man, if it does, this team looks a lot better. I mean, it's interesting because Kyle Isbell is kind of like the outfield version of Michael Garcia, where it's like the defense is potentially so good. In Isabel's case, it's already demonstrated that, like, if he's just an average hitter, he's extremely valuable sure. and far more than and, and and deeply underrated, like nationally. Like, nobody's talking about Kyle Isabel, but I don't think people realize just how good Kyle Isabel was defensively last year, such that he was. You, you, I mentioned that Bobby Witt was the most valuable position player on the team last year. Kyle Isabel was second. Yeah. Kyle Isbell after was third overall after Witt and Reagans. Who was the most valuable member of the 2023 Royals? Kyle Isbell, because he was tremendous defensive center fielder, played a key position and was plus 13 defensively, according to defensive runs saved. Um, so yeah, even with a below average bat, he was valuable. If he's a 330 OBP and and that, you're talking about a four-win player. You're talking about a really good player. Uh, by the way, the chat room is doing well. Noah John says, I haven't heard Mazzucato's name once. Well, you weren't listening to Noah John. I, I I brought him up, but I brought him up as an example of like a pitcher who didn't improve. Right. So yeah. Uh and the one, but the one that really made me laugh out loud. <clears throat> Mark, the Isbell thing makes me think there's a potential gas leak at Sorrent's house. Hope you're right, but yikes. <laughs> Do you have a radon detector in your home? Surrender uh, carbon monoxide. Yeah, we do. And okay. and like every other the scam of when you buy a home, everyone's got a what do they test you? They make you also you gotta put some pipe to vent crap out your house. I can't yeah, the radon that. Thing. Is that radon? Yeah, radon. yeah, I think it's radon. I think okay. it's a complete scam, personally. But anyway. I mean, it's anytime you bring up something radioactive, we all freak out, right? I maybe maybe you're right. Maybe they just use the threat it's of radioactive. radioactive. Just, we'll do know. anything to avoid radioactive. Um I think it's a scam. It's an industry. Every time you go to sell a house, the inspector comes in and goes, oh, you don't have one of those? The radon's high. Call this guy. Uh, You know, I I, I think it's it's a worthwhile thing to check, but it's like, do we have to check it every time the house sells? Like, did did radiation move into my home from the last time it was sold? I I just... I don't get it. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. Did someone... Sneak, sneak uranium under under my home in the last ten years. I, yeah, I I agree. There's something a little fishy going on there. Yeah, um, I'm sure we'll, right, we'll, hear, we'll hear hear it now from the realtors in uh, in in the group. So uh, anyway, um, so my last one, I really like this one because it's very bold, but there's it, it there's a possibility this will happen, and I, I really enjoy this one. Cole Reagans will break the all time record for strikeouts in a season by a Royal. Do you know who holds the all-time record for strikeouts in a season? Kevin Apier? No. Uh, David Kevin. Cohn? No, not David Cohn. Dennis Leonard. Dennis Leonard. 244 strikeouts. In 300 in innings. And, in, in, uh, yeah, about 293. Yep. Yeah. In 1977. But think about it. When you think about how much strikeouts have gone up, you know, over the years. 244 in 90, he said a night a striker record in 1977. It tells you just how many freaking innings he was throwing, but it was pretty, pretty impressive. Zach Greinke came very close in his Zion year, he got to 242. Uh, only two other Royals have even gotten to 200. Kevin Apier did it one year, and our uh, all time team favorite Bob Johnson did it in 1970. He is but, a he is a favorite of mine, yeah. So 244 is the record. 
which sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but Cole Reagan's, his strikeout rate last year, I believe was after the trade, as a member of the Royals, yeah, it was 11.2 strikeouts uh, per nine inning. So if you do the math, um, which I should have done probably beforehand, but you know, that's okay. Um, I believe he would need to get, if he kept, if he kept that strikeout rate up, he would need about 185 innings, uh, in order to get to 244 strikeouts. So, I mean, you know, he's career high in, in innings is something like 110. We, we both assume that he's not going to get much past 160, 107, mm-hmm. but if he can pitch as well as he did last year, maybe even a little bit better on the strikeouts. He could very well challenge that. And if the Royals are in the race all year and they end up having to keep him out there for 32 starts because they're trying to make the playoffs and he gets to 190 innings, he might break a record that has stood for 47 years. Well, further proof that great minds think alike. um... Don't tell me you have the exact same thing. MJ Melendez will break the Royals strikeout record. (laughs) No, that's actually not what I had. I was just being a, a, a jerk about it. But I was going to say Nick Prado, and then I opened it up. I'm like, did did Jorge Soler break Bo Jackson's? He did. Okay, is 178, but third is MJ Melendez last year. Wow, 170. Salvi had 170 and 21. Bo had 172 and 89. Jorge Soler had 178 in 2019. It, I mean, what they it just says how far ahead of his time Bo Jackson was yeah. that he's had a record his his strikeout record lasted almost as long as Dennis Leonard's has. Um, it's impressive the Royals haven't had anybody go above 180. I mean, in a in an era where you know guys hit 200 sometimes. Um, but I, I I'm assuming you got a different one for us. I, I'm going to finish. I've got two. I've got actually about five more, but it's down to two. Um. The bolder one I'll go with for the okay. purposes of entertainment portions of the show. MJ Melendez hits 30 plus home runs. Yeah. And Bolder. strikes out 221 times. <laughs> Comes to modern day Mark Reynolds. The modern day. God, how old are we that Mark Reynolds is no longer modern day? So, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, thir- I don't know if I, it's 220 strikeouts, he's going to need to hit like 40 home runs to make that worthwhile. But I mean, 30 home runs, yes. I think that he absolutely could do that. If he ha- if he's the breakout player that we're both picking him to be, he kind of has to get to 30 or very close to it, in my opinion. So yeah. um, the question is, can he do that and maybe strike out 160 times? And if I, he assume, does, I, I assume, by the way, Noah's reacting to yours. If that happens, trade him. Could be either one of us. Yes, he's exactly. talking about that's a great call. I think he was talking towards your Cole Reagans. He says, if that happens, trade him. But I don't know if he's talking about my MJ Melendez 30 homers. Noah John is not what we'd call an optimist with a lot of his comments. Right. So I was going to say, if the stuff we're talking about happens, the Royals will actually be, not be in a position to trade anybody because they're going to be winning. Yeah, he says, no, the MJ 30 homer. If that happens, trade him. So, fair he's not a believer. All right, that leaves us with one thing, Randy, as we... Vowed to not go a full hour, an hour and three minutes into it. Uh, are you ready to flip? I'm ready. I'm about to flip this. Okay, hang on. Let me. Where's I gotta go towards my? Camera. Yeah, I know. Find 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 your camera. Okay, I gotta. All right. It's like I'm I'm backwards on my <laughs> here. The way I move. Right. Actually, like the windows there, but it's I know, there. I know. Oh, that's why okay. we have feedback. One, on three. One, two, three. Okay, we're two games. Two games. I told you we'd be within two games. Okay, all right. Well, I was worried we'd be identical. So, for the record, Seren is the optimist this time. He predicts seventy-seven wins. I'm predicting seventy-five wins. Well, I thought for sure you'd be just like me. If you're going to get anywhere around it, you might as well take last year's win total. Well, I was about to say the, the one of the reasons I did what I did was seventy-seven was our pick last year, and that didn't work out well. So I was like, I need to avoid that number. Um. So I mean, we, we both feel like you know this is. It's it's going to be a much improved team, right? Just in terms of record, um, I'll give you by way of example, Joe Sheehan, who put out his CC predictions, has the Royals at 73 wins, and yet he has the Royals improving their record by more wins than any other team in baseball. They are the most improved team, even at 73, because they won 56 last year. Like <laughs> it's it's easy to forget how bad 56 wins is. 56 wins is farther away from a 69-win team than a 69-win team is from a 500. 
Like 69 to 93 is a bad team. The Royals were farther from bad than bad is to average. So 73, 75, 77, all of these constitute significant improvement. It's just not quite enough for them to be relevant after the deadline. By the way, I think Mark is talking about Melendez. All while throwing to the wrong base no fewer than seven times and deflecting at least one ball off his head to a teammate. So, you know, uh, there you go. Yeah, and this is what I was going to say about Salvi. I actually think they could be chugging along. I think that this organization is going to be analytically driven. And if they're sitting at 500 and they're three and a half games out, I think they'll still move him. Like, I don't think it. that is I, – I think they're going to try to move him no matter what because it's the right thing to do for this team. Big picture, long term. And the idea that they're going to back ass into the playoffs and then do some damage in the World Series, I mean, I'll, I with new information, I reserve the right to change my opinion. But for them to be a team that not only, like, could they make the playoffs? Yes, if the division just stinks. Tigers have injuries. Twins have injuries. I think the Guardians would be the team that might fold uh, and be worse than their talent. And if all that happens and they get there, but for them to actually be a team that you think can win series, Cole Riggins is going to have to do what you said, set a strikeout record. Brady Singer is going to have to be good Brady Singer all the time. And Alec Marsh is going to have to be, or Chris Bubich, and then Waka and Lugo, or Lugo takes a step. But there's going to have to be three guys that do things they've never done before in, in the starting rotation. And if that happens and like all these other positives with the hitting, I suppose they could win some playoff series, but I even think if this team would make a magical run in there, it'd be more about the division and this team, and they'll be smart enough to go ahead and deal Salvador Perez. Getting closer to the end of the contract, I think it's more likely that he gets dealt. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think That's the a, world... I saw, we don't have to go back to that. I just want to yeah. explain. It's when I say that I don't think it's just because they're having a bad year. I think they could be having a pretty good year. Better than some people think they're going to have, and they'll still and still trade them. I mean, you know, it would obviously just hurt as a fan to you know the one link back to the World Series, and even before that, you know, being being traded away. But from the standpoint of the you know evaluation process of the organization, the way the pro- the organization functions in the Piccolo era as opposed to the Dayton Moore era, yeah, it would be a good sign that they're not they're not uh, beholden to anybody, that they're not letting emotion and loyalty trump you know, the cold, hard reality of how you build a, a winning playoff team. Um, I think they could, I think they could be in a, in a, in a difficult position in the sense of right at the cusp of, do they sell out and may, move Salvi versus do they, you know, try and stay in the race um, in the last two months of the year? My, my feeling, the reason I ended up going being 75 wins only, and, and actually a little more pessimistic than you, like I said, they've made a lot of these little incremental decisions like, you know, going with Marsh and going with, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, now I've lost my train of thought completely, but like the guys they chose in the bullpen, keeping sour, et cetera, um, that they're, they're making all the little moves that I like that show me that they're kind of heading in the right direction. But when I took a step back, I just ultimately had to decide that the overall talent level of the roster it's just a little bit less than I was, you know, than I maybe had convinced myself at the spring training beginning. It's they they've they've come a long way from 56 and 106, but you have to acknowledge where they started. And so on paper, this is still, you know, it's probably a low 70s win team, even accounting for the fact that they seem to be heading in the right direction. That bumps them up a little bit for me, but just not quite enough to get into like spitting range of of 500 and, and contention. Yeah. Um, I, they're improved. They're improved. There may be some wishful. That's a good point. I mean, I don't like the lineup as much, you know, but if Velasquez hits the ball, then that looks a lot better. Maybe I'm a little tinged by, you know, wasn't seen as much in, in spring training. Right. I had somebody say to me today, they think, okay, it's time for real. And they think he's going to hit. I hope so. I mean, we just don't have a huge track record, but I mean, ultimately this team is, is, is very, the lineup is very reliant on its young hitting core which has been, aside from Bobby Witt, very up and down since these guys reached the major league. So Melendez, Pasquantino obviously being hurt. You know, Velasquez is a, could be a flash in the pan. Like Michael Massey, who knows? Like they, in order for them to be good, all they have to kind of be right on all of these young guys at once. They yeah. might be. And if they are, they'd be awesome, both because they'll be good this year, but also because those guys are the core, you know, of the future of this team. They're going to be around for three or four years at least. 
Um, but it just seems unlikely that they're going to be right about all of those guys. And the depth behind them, you know, when you're relying on Hunter Renfro and Adam Frazier and Garrett Hampson, um, that's a little dicey. Uh, Travis says it best. Actual games to recap on the next pod. Mm -hmm. uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, I hope everybody enjoys opening day, and let's hope the Royals get off to a good start. That's for sure. You want a good start on fixing your parking lot? It's our friends at GNS Salt and Concrete. Kansas City's best for 30 years. Happy anniversary to GNS Salt and Concrete. One contractor, all things parking lot. Every project comes with a written warning. Find them online at ganasphalt.com for the good doctor. Randy Gisarely, I'm Seren Petro saying thank you very much for joining us here on the College.